I obviously love historical fashion, but I also love antique jewelry. So I thought it'd be fun to go through some of my favorite weird and wonderful antique jewelry pieces. Because let's face it, a lot of the things that are weird are also pretty wonderful, like my hairstyle. Some of these items are from my own personal antique collection as I'm a collector of antique jewelry. And other items are from museum archives that I found, mainly looking for bizarre historical fashion, which is another series that I have going. This is kind of like a spin-off on that series. History is full of some fascinating and unique jewelry trends. I'm constantly surprised by what I end up finding, so I felt like a lot of what I dug up really did deserve its own designated video. The very first item I'd like to speak about is a type of ring that was popular specifically throughout the Georgian, Victorian, and Edwardian periods, and they're known as acrostic rings. Acrostic rings are amazing because the different stones spell out a specific word. So two of the most common words that you see historically are are regard and dearest. So for dearest, it would be diamond, emerald, amethyst, ruby, emerald, sapphire, tourmaline? I think it's tourmaline. Unfortunately, this is the only photo that I was able to find of an example, and I believe that this is a slightly more modern example, but it at least helps to get the point across. All the other specimens I found are copyrighted, so I don't want to infringe upon that. But if you Google acrostic ring, you will see exactly what I mean. They're very, very cool specimens, and they are often given between people that loved each other. I've always wanted to own an acrostic ring myself, in fact, but they're incredibly expensive, so perhaps that will be for some future investment. Another popular jewelry trend throughout the Victorian era was hair jewelry. Now, hair often represented the sentiments of someone that was deceased, so it would be worn as a sentimental item to remember that person. It's not uncommon during this time to find locks of hair that are in brooches, but this set of earrings takes that a step further as the hair is used in order to actually weave the earrings. I think this is a very lovely example of that, and I'm a massive fan of visible mourning and mourning jewelry in general so I think that this is a really special way to remember someone that's passed. This next item is one from my personal collection and it's a 19th century cameo brooch that I bought maybe about two years ago. And the reason why I find this one to be so weird is actually because of the color scheme and I think it's a perfect example of the ugly pretty that you tend to see in Victorian things. Victorians had this way of combining colors that you would never expect to put together and somehow it still kind of does work. And it has this bubblegum pink and cobalt blue combination with the lover's knot. And you can see this sort of gentle etching within the knot itself too. It's a very detailed brooch. I love the thing, but it's always super hard to pair outfits up with it because it's very rare that I'm going to be wearing pink and cobalt blue together. <laughs> Next up are lover's eye brooches, which were really popular during the 18th century. These would be miniature portraits that you would have painted of someone you love, but it would be just their eyes, so you couldn't actually see who it was. It's rumored that individuals would have these made of people that they perhaps were secretly crushing on, so that way no one else would be able to identify the individual, yet they would still be able to keep a part of them close. I think these are really unique pieces, and they just continue to solidify the ingenuity of people in the past. We've spoken about hair being used for morning jewelry, but hand motifs were actually also a very popular aspect of morning jewelry. You tend to see a lot of these hand brooches, and I'm a collector of them, so whenever they come up on eBay randomly, I will often pick them. Okay, I'm not buying like every single hand brooch, but if I happen to see a good deal on one, then I will go ahead and get it. Here are three hand morning brooches from my own personal collection, and you can see that they're all slightly different. I love how this little one is almost like a miniature version of the larger one with the little wreath, and I really like this one that has nothing in its hand and it's just pointing. These hands can be holding all sorts of different motifs and I believe that the different items that they're holding usually has some type of symbolism to it. I'm just not exactly sure what specific symbolism each thing means. But yeah, I just think that they're absolutely lovely pieces and I definitely want to add more of them to my collection. I thought it'd be fun to have my own go at making some weird and wonderful antique looking jewelry and that's why I'd like to thank the sponsor of today's video, Skillshare, for helping me out. This month I took a course called Creating Earrings and Beadwork Technique by Valentina Kalinina, and I made this gorgeous set of beaded and crystal earrings. I decided to go for a bit of an Art Nouveau Victorian design as I wanted it to fit with my historical clothing. I'm by no means a jewelry maker, in fact this pushed me way out of my comfort zone, and I had to restart this project a few times before I finally got the hang of it. The class is super straightforward, but my brain just 
wasn't putting everything together for some reason. Being able to make some of my own jewelry to wear with various outfits has been a goal of mine for a while, and I believe that no goal is too small, but learning a new skill can be intimidating. That's why Skillshare simplifies the process by helping take the pressure off by starting small. Skillshare teachers take you step by step through whatever course you choose, and Although for me this applies to my journey with jewelry making at the moment, this concept really relates to so many other aspects in life. For example, I've been working as a freelancer for a long time now, but entering into this new creative chapter of starting a YouTube channel and learning to sew a couple of years ago was a completely new journey for me. Traditional work and jobs are not a one size fits all. They definitely did not work well for me, for example. With Skillshare, you can learn how to design a career to fit you. You may know Skillshare for classes in photography, photography, film and video editing, and illustration, but Skillshare has hundreds of career-focused classes too. I've really been enjoying a number of career-related Skillshare courses, in particular their selections on building a creative career, such as Pricing Your Work and Negotiating with Clients by Jesse Ledoux, and Building a Filmmaking Career, How to Find Success as a Video Creator by Simon Cade. Both of these courses have been extremely helpful and have provided me with a lot of clarity when it comes to running this YouTube channel. And since 2023 is just starting, the New Year is the perfect time to reinvent your goals and pursue your passion. The first 1,000 people to use the link below will get a one month free trial of Skillshare. Thanks so much to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Now back to examining some weird and wonderful antique jewelry. Another very unique and special item from my collection is a hazelnut brooch. Hazelnut jewelry was apparently a thing in the Victorian era, which I only recently found out maybe about a year ago when I came across this brooch. I ended up seeing another one on eBay at some point, so I'm guessing that there was a fair amount of these being made and distributed. One of my favorite things about this brooch is actually the detail. You can see that in the brass, they've included all the little veins, and the clasp on the back is actually a little tree branch, which I think is absolutely beautiful. The reason why I know this brooch is Victorian is because if you can see here, there's a little T-bar and that T-bar is a classic sign of a Victorian dated brooch. And also the clasp is in a C shape, which is another defining factor. I also love that you can rotate the hazelnut and if you haven't noticed, it is of course a real hazelnut. So they're utilizing something in nature and turning it into jewelry, which I'm a massive fan of. I think you're all going to get a kick out of this. This might look like an ordinary necklace, but it actually has a little bit of a surprise. This is a uranium glass necklace from around the 1930s, which is a time when uranium glass was very popular. If you've ever seen uranium glass before, then you'll know that it actually glows under a UV light. So that's what you can see here, that the uranium inside is glowing and it's completely safe to use. It isn't a significant enough amount of uranium for it to be dangerous or anything like that. Otherwise, I wouldn't be showing it here on this channel since this is an item from my own personal collection. In addition to uranium glass jewelry, there's all sorts of uranium glassware that you can also buy from around the 1930s. And for some reason, whenever I see these items under a UV light, all I can think of is a weird speakeasy rave. Bugs were a super common motif throughout the Victorian era and into the Edwardian and even Art Deco. So whilst you can find specimens like these in museums, I also have a couple that are in my own personal collection. Firstly, I have this little beetle brooch and it's some type of paste stone that's meant to look like amethyst. And I just think it's absolutely adorable. I believe it dates to about the 1920s or 30s based off of the clasp and the hinge. And this thing, as you can see, is about the size of my thumb fingernail. So it's extremely small and delicate. I actually thought for a while that it was a spider because somehow the way that the legs are done and the body and the antenna make it feel like a spider but then it only has six legs so that's why I'm assuming that it's some sort of beetle instead. And then I have this adorable example of a Victorian antique fly pin which basically has this little coiled needle which then goes into your tie or into your collar and it makes it look like the fly is slightly suspended and this thing is absolutely tiny but I just think it's so incredibly delicate and precious and it's so sweet to just be able to have a little pearl fly somewhere on your garment that's slightly sticking up. In addition to these two items, you can find all sorts of other bug-related jewelry from those specific eras. We tend to think of choker necklaces as a 1990s thing or even a naughties thing, 
but it turns out that the Victorians were wearing choker necklaces too. And with that being said, I guess even the Georgians were as well. This specific specimen is from about the 1870s and it is a perfect example of how the choker necklace was quite fashionable during the Victorian era. I just thought I'd throw this one in there because I think it always shocks people to find out that Victorians were wearing chokers. It's one of those moments where people of the past are once again proven to be more modern than we might think. I've spoken in the past about grape earrings and how I really want to own a pair of them. The specific sketch is from 1825 to 1830 because grape earrings were super popular during the Regency period as well as into the 1820s and 1830s. To be fair though, the grape motif is popular all up through the Victorian era and into Art Deco even. I have this large lot of a bunch of grape brooches from about the 1930s and the reason I bought them is because I actually want to fashion them into a matching set of earrings and a grape strand necklace in order to kind of mimic the styles that were popular during the Regency era and going into the Victorian period. These are always really cleverly designed because every little bead is used to mimic essentially a grape on a bunch. So it's actually a really sweet way to have a very realistic looking grape as well because it actually has a bit of movement to it. And in that same theme, this is actually a pair of basket earrings, which are antique, but I'm not totally sure from when. Again, it's one of those things where cute everyday items are being made into jewelry and I am all for it. Another common motif that you see throughout Victorian jewelry are buckles. So I have this perfect example of a buckle bracelet in my collection and it has all this gorgeous leaf patterning on it but what I love about this bracelet is that in order to get it on your wrist you actually have to undo the buckle and take the bracelet apart and I just think it's absolutely adorable. It's like a little tiny belt for your wrist. I also have this little silver buckle ring in my collection which I believe is vintage and not actually antique but it's another example of one of these buckle motifs motifs being used historically, and you tend to see buckle rings like these in the Victorian era as well. What really impresses me about all these historical motifs is that unlike hot couture today, which utilizes a wide assortment of unique objects in fashion, these would have been items for everyday people. So that means that everyday people would have been wearing buckles and hands and hair jewelry and all these other things. Obviously jewelry was a luxury to some degree, but by the Victorian era things could be massive manufactured and produced at such a scale that if you wanted to own something for a much less expensive price that perhaps had a hand motif or a buckle on it, you generally could. This last item is one of the newest pieces in my collection and it is what I call the egg yolk brooch. This is made up of a bunch of amber and it's antique from the Victorian era and you can tell because of the t-hinge on the back and again that c-clasp that we saw earlier. There are a lot of things that I love about this brooch but one of the things that I find very unique is this egg yolk looking amber is actually quite a rare type of Baltic amber. To me this right away just felt like some sort of weird alien brooch. It's a little bit hard to tell in video but one of these faceted amber stones in the middle actually has a teeny tiny fossilized ant suspended in it. Amber is actually fossilized tree resin so sometimes you get different artifacts that are suspended within the amber and I was so surprised to find this little tiny ant there. Who knows how old this little guy is. Also, as you can see, quite a few of the different stones are missing, but to me that doesn't take away from its value because I find it to be just such a unique piece. Well, I hope you all enjoyed looking through some of the weird and wonderful pieces in my own antique jewelry collection and a few items as well from different museum archives. If you haven't seen it yet, I highly recommend watching my video reviewing bizarre Victorian fashion items next. Thank you so much for watching and I'm actually taking an extra week off this month, so I will see you all in three weeks for another video video.